What's up guys, welcome back to the NFT Talks podcast. Now today, uh, we're gonna have a lot of gems. We have the NFT attorney, and he is talking about the legal matters in regards to the rights. Also touching on regulations, collaborations, and IPs when it comes to NFTs. So this is a subject that's not really talked about in the space as much. I haven't really seen anything on it. And he's kindly come on to talk about pretty much everything uh, and cover, answer a few questions and, you know, look into the space. So whether you're on the treadmill, if you're driving the car, you need to stop, get your notepads out and listen and take notes because this is something that you would have to pay for. And he's kindly come on, he's gonna talk about pretty much everything in the NFT space, covering a lot of things. So make sure you subscribe and leave your comments below and let's help build this community. So welcome back to the NFT Talks podcast. Um, I'm here with a guest today that is going to bring a lot of value uh, and guarantee that is Jacob Martin. And he goes by the name of the NFT attorney. So I can guess you can already know that kind of where this is going to end up. And I'm sure a lot of people are going to have a lot of questions, but I'm going to try and get as much out of uh, Jacob while I've got his time here. Uh, welcome, Jacob. And thank you for taking the time out to speak to me today. Yeah, hey guys, I'm uh, happy to be here. Yeah, so just before we get into the the, in the deeper uh, things and asking about NFTs and whatnot, let everyone know a bit about yourself, uh, background-wise, and to where you ended up now. Yeah, for sure. I uh, I also think you'll appreciate, you know, I um, I don't really use British slang very often or, or European slang very often, but I do use the word cheeky when I describe my Twitter handle, because the NFT attorney, it's, it's a joke. It's a tongue in cheek reference. It's uh, the, the work I do is, is serious quite often and it's important, but there's no such thing as an NFT attorney. That's not a bracketed subgroup of barristers or lawyers, <laughs> right? It's not a, it's not a true specialty. So sometimes I'll tell people, I'm like, you know, I've got this cheeky like Twitter thing, but it's, you know, it's just, like, don't take it too seriously. Um, it might, it might just be though. It might just be. It, it, might. <laughs> it might be. But for now, I, uh, I leave uh, my, my, my bio on Twitter says, "Am I the NFT attorney?" And my answer is maybe. maybe. I don't, I don't say yes. It's like, yeah, maybe. Um, but yeah. So I'm, I live in LA. Um, I'm an attorney that actually started. I started a company myself in law school, um, focused on smart contracts and wills and trusts. So I tried to like basically automate probate because um, the wealth transition, whether it's a lot of money or no money, just it's always chaos and families have problems. So I, I've been a, I've been quite bullish on automated asset movement, automated access, automated transfer of homes or transfer of, of everything. I've been big on that for really four and a half years now, four years, like really near the advent of smart contracts. I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Um, that's better than lawyers. So I, you know, I tried to, I tried to build that out. The tech was a little, a little early and we were in crypto winter. So we raised some money, but ultimately the project, the project failed um, in, in that form. And so uh, I went to just working with startups as an attorney and you know that's that's kind of my vibe like i've always enjoyed startups i've always enjoyed innovation and technology um and the practice like the law practice that i i wanted to have was you know blockchain startups technology somewhere in there but it was it was really you know small businesses some tech startups whatever and then when nfts came on my radar it was probably about december and I had a friend remind me that he tried to get me to accept some free crypto kitties in 2017. And I said, no, because I didn't like cats. Oh, and so <laughs> I missed out on that one um, for silly reasons. Um, but I was like, I don't really, I don't really care for cats too much. So even though it's kind of like Pokemon and there's breeding yeah. and it's cool, I don't, I don't care. Um, and I just didn't see the big picture because I was working on different smart contracts. Okay. And so once I saw, and you know what I mean? Like I was working on these like real smart contracts to me where it was like transitioning real things, not digital assets. Yeah. But once NFTs, you know, I saw NBA top shots and I was kind of like, okay, this is cute. 
Like, this is cute. Mm -hmm. This seems fun. I have collectibles as well. But it took me about um, a week of going down the rabbit hole, as you kind of mentioned yourself doing, where I was like, oh, there's a lot of chaos here. There's tax implications. There's IP implications. There's like split royalties is this huge, weird question mark, right? There's just like, yeah. once I realized that there were really no attorneys or accountants working on it actively, I was like, well, I could do that. Like I could, yeah. I could be the, the attorney here or at least one of, you know, like let's, let's see what's going on. So I asked my wife if I could just go spend all my time figuring it out for a month. <laughs> and she said, yes. And so I spent the month of January running into February, really just being like, do I understand everything happening here? Mm -hmm. um, and what regulation does and doesn't exist. And I came out of that, spun up a Twitter, spun up the Instagram, spun up the website. And I was like, yeah, I think I can, I can do this. Like I know enough to be useful. Um, and then very, very rapidly brought on some really great clients and have been advising some of the largest like auction houses and talent agencies and, working with my, I mean, I prefer working with small time creatives, but, um, you know, a lot of small time creatives actually just don't even hire an attorney. They just go for it and hope yeah, for yeah, the best, true, you know? True. So I'm in that, that kind of back and forth where it's like, I don't want to work for the, for the man. Like I'm not going to work for Disney and help Disney sue a little guy. Mm -hmm. But if the little guy doesn't want to pay for an attorney, then it leaves me in kind of the middle working with like agencies or auction houses or artists or IP hold. You know what I mean? There's this kind yeah. of middle where people want advice because they're worried a little bit. So I don't know. My, my advice and my, my clientele is kind of all over, all over the place, which is fun. I prefer it that way. Um, I've been paid in art and sneakers and doge. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the, I guess that's the three minute version there. Yeah, I think that's it's crazy when like the way you you kind of like you've created a, a role for yourself, but it definitely is needed, hundred percent. Mm -hmm. Um, as, as you describe NFTs as the World Wide West at the moment, <laughs> and no. there, there needs to be there need there does need to be some kind of order. Or some, I mean, structure to a certain extent because, as well as it, there's amazing opportunities. There's 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 th there's things that are going to happen where it can cause implications for individuals and creators and getting sued and whatnot. And that's just uh, that's just being truthful, isn't it? So um, right. What what I've I already wanna... seen several. I've seen several cease and desist letters. Yeah, I've worked on. I've worked on. Um, there was a big case that went to court yesterday with Jay Z. I didn't work on that, but I was working on a copyright infringement case as far back as early March. Really? Um, so when, on, when, a, on a to, it was to private, what level? But, to what level are these going? Is it to the level of YouTube in regards to using somebody's music in your NFT? Or is it the case of, because I've seen different, I, I, what brought it to my attention when I've seen um, uh, an artist, I, I can't remember the name of the artist, they were using like Supreme, the, the brand, the, the, mm. the, they're using Supreme logo everywhere. And I'm thinking, well, how can they do that and sell the piece of work? And it, it, obviously they, they're not working with Supreme. So how does that work? Right, and right. Ring the alarm bells for me. And I, I can imagine eventually, um these guys are gonna when they come into the space because they will um right and <laughs> they're gonna come looking and obviously i don't know how, how they're probably gonna want their money back aren't they or people are gonna have, to have their nfts that's been yeah you know, yeah there was uh there was it's interesting because with supreme take supreme there was um one of my favorite pieces uh, by one of my favorite artists Stephen okay. balte mm -hmm. has like the Pillsbury Doughboy sitting on top of a bull and there's a Supreme logo on the bull. Um, um, and it's like all of these different logos and all these different things. Um, but it's likely going to, like all of that sits firmly in this category of satire, satire or fan art or something where like, okay. if you look at it and you go, that quite obviously isn't Supreme. Well, yeah. then great. It isn't Supreme and Supreme has nothing to sue about. Does that make sense? Okay. okay. That makes sense. So, yeah. that, and, and that's a very crude short version of me describing mm -hmm. it, but that's roughly how it's viewed. It's like when you see, um, essentially, if you see anything Batman and it looks like pretty good, like it looks like Batman, you're like, oh, that's Batman. Well, then that's like suable basically. 
But when you see the Supreme logo and your first thought is, huh, that's the Supreme logo. But that's quite obviously not Supreme. If it's just, you know, if it's just clearly not a Supreme piece, then they have nothing to sue over, right? Mm. They just might be annoyed that you're using their logo. Yeah. Um, there can was a still piece sue? just... Can they still sue um, them? Can they say, look, look, because this is what they can do on YouTube, isn't it? Like, I'm, I'm just referring back to what's already happening. Right, now. right. If you play a song, so, they can just take it down. So the difference there is that if you're using the song, you're using like the actual song, right? Mm -hmm. And with, let's take like taking Supreme, you're not using actual Supreme merch or anything. You're using like a logo or the word Supreme that makes sense, but you know, this isn't a Supreme made piece. Yeah. And you're not selling it, trying to tell people that Supreme helped make it or Supreme sponsored it or Supreme yeah. partnered. You're just using their logo. So I, I hope that's like a clear enough delineation. Like there, there is like a, there's a gap there. Um, mm -hmm. Because like the most famous, the most famous use case of all time is Andy Warhol painting the Campbell soup can, right? Yeah. yeah. Like one of his most iconic paintings that sells for bajillions of dollars, right? 10, 20, $30 million for original Warhol soup cans. It looks like a Campbell soup can. Yeah. But because of the transformative nature of it and doing it on a canvas and painting it on a canvas and adding the slightest change, even though you look at it and you go, oh, that's a Campbell soup can. It's like, mm, but it's an Andy Warhol soup can, right? It's different. Yeah. yeah. So there are definitely make sense. some nuances. <laughs> There's some nuances in there for sure. Uh, and I don't say it to you assuming it to sound perfectly clean. It's not, it's not the cleanest like argument in the world, um, which is, you know, the reminder that like lawyers are like way cheaper if you use them before you screw something up. Yeah. Okay. So like if you, if you get advice on, I want to do this, even if it's simple, you probably be better off paying a lawyer $200 for a half hour of coffee mm -hmm. and their opinion on what you're thinking of doing yeah. than it is for you to do it and then get your cease and desist letter from Supreme and then pay the lawyer yeah. 700 pounds an hour to write a response letter that might take them five hours of a response letter, right? It might be five grand just to tell Supreme why you didn't break the rules. Yeah. Okay. Well, that makes complete sense. And it's, I think that's the, well, it's, you're right. I think this is the approach that people need to kind of take. Um, and they need to take it seriously because it, it is serious. It can go seriously wrong, can't it? There, there is a, <laughs> there is a case that these companies are out there and that i mean i spoke to a, a creator um yesterday and he was mentioning that uh dc have wrote a letter um mm, a, yeah, of, yeah. A, stern, a stern letter saying look okay look we noticed some of you guys are using our obviously ip for uh, your yeah, nfts yeah. You, unless you've got the the go ahead from this email you please do not do it so they've, right. they've put their warning out there haven't they i mean i don't know if you have you seen that yourself Oh yeah. Yeah. Do you see? So I chatted with a group of illustrators, really high end illustrators that work with DC and Marvel quite a lot and the comic book legal defense fund. Like I've been in those conversations as well with kind of the group trying to figure out what can we do? What should we do? How should we push back or negotiate? Um, and, you know, DC, if you go read I guess we probably don't have time to go fully down the rabbit hole of how yeah. it works, but like, basically this is why I said earlier, like I'm not accepting roles from the biggest IP holders. Like I'm not helping them sue the little guy for infringing. Yeah. I'm more interested in working with the little guy proverbially, right? The, the, the small fish. I'm more interested in helping them figure out what they can do yeah. than helping the big guys figure out what can we sue everyone else for doing why is that you know why what i mean that? why why are you taking that stance because clearly if you did work for the big guys i mean they have big you make money. more money yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you make more money but what why why personally why, yeah. why are you taking that stance so i think the 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 tone of blockchain and just decentralization in general is just like this i'm definitely not anti-capitalism like to be fair but the idea of redistributing like artistic capital to the artists creating the art 
instead yeah. of the suits in the tower building the camp like the empire i think that's pretty important like it blew my mind when i heard someone talk about uh, they worked on tomb raider uh lark no uh the video game that went with the angelina jolie tomb raider so like a while yeah. back okay and they were saying they spent two and a half years on it and made like 55 grand a year wow and they were one of the lead <laughs> designers on the game like one of the lead lead people in the game yeah. and i'm like wait we're talking about a franchise that makes 200 300 500 million every time a, a lara croft tomb raider film comes out and they make 50 million off each game and you're telling me one of their highest end like art game designers made 50k a year mm. so that just doesn't strike me well like from any industry and so when i think of nfts and i'm like okay we're talking about a way for people to make thousands of dollars with little to no overhead, right? With the ability to use their skills that they already use every day for their 50 grand a year or whatever they're making. So yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's a personal stance, right? But my personal stance has just been like, um, you know, I turned down a job from one of the big four Hollywood talent agencies to come in house and be their like head of, blockchain and nfts yeah. because i was like will this make me exclusive to your talent and they were like yeah and i was like well i don't want to be exclusive to your talent there's too many things happening too fast in too many different directions yeah and i get i get random emails every day can you, can you help with this hey this is going on hey what you know what do you think about this and it's like well i'd i'd rather be available and flexible than tied to any major campaign or corporate entity you know i'm happy to help yeah. the big guys too um i've actually spent some time over the last couple of months working with both christie's and sotheby's in various ways okay. but that's because they're still putting the artists first yes right it's they're right. helping yeah, the true. artists yeah yeah so it's you know that's how i see that um yeah okay so you yeah that's you you have been busy <laughs> you clearly have been busy and you have been doing a lot of things and it's good to see and it's and it's a good thing to, to know that even though you could go down that route you're still taking that stance um in regards to just you're yeah, helping the little guys and leveling the playing grounds and making it a bit fair and that's what the blockchain and crypto has all been about and you you clearly just haven't you've got your expertise but you're uh, you've you were a part of the community before you started doing what mm. you're doing in the nft space and i think that's amazing um let's go into a question um about Good. about rights and just mm -hmm. talk about yeah like when selling an nft whether you're a musician or you're an artist let's talk about what kind of rights just i mean i've, I've got my views on it but i mean i'd like to hear from yourself um yeah so i mean i'll i'll narrow the broad question a little bit to answer it if if you're using, if, if an individual is selling an NFT in general, usually it says in the terms, there are no commercial rights associated with this NFT. Meaning you bought the NFT, so you are allowed to keep it in your digital wallet, look at it, or resell it, right? That's all you're allowed to do with most NFTs. You can't reproduce the music, remix the music, sell the music to make money off of it, utilize the music in your own NFTs. You can't do any of that with a typical purchase. A typical purchase is just you get this digital collectible, just like if you went and bought a record from a record store for $5. Yeah. You now get to listen to the record, keep the record, or sell the record. Those are your options. An NFT is roughly the same. Is this a standard um, setup for a lot of these marketplaces? So like things like OpenSea, uh, Rarible, Foundation and whatnot, are, they, are these, just, would you say, I mean, I don't know if you know that, but is that generally yeah, yeah, across yeah. the board? Yeah, so that is generally across the board, yeah. So OpenSea is the one where, OpenSea is the one which is the, the loosest maybe, maybe like the most customizable. Whereas like when you buy on, on Maker's Place, It'll say on the bottom right of the of the page where you're purchasing, like almost always, buyer understands that they are receiving no commercial rights to this NFT. Okay. So like that is the marketplace standard. That is the general standard. Um, 
OpenSea, since it allows you to basically customize and sell whatever you want, can vary from project to project. But the terms of service and like the general understanding is that you don't have commercial rights or like really any rights other than to display it as your you know, avatar, profile photo or whatever, unless the description at the sale says that you can, you know, like okay. you are getting this by purchasing this or what they'll refer to sometimes as unlockable content, right? Yeah. So like, yeah. if you buy this NFT, then you will send us your email address at this email address and we will send you over an mp4 of this song just for yourself yeah right like and does, okay and does does that when they send over it, whatever they send in your lockables once again if it is a form of music or whatnot do they does a, as a creator do you need to state that this is not you don't have the right to this music also or, or is it does that still apply because it's it was in the initial smart contract for the nft in the first place yeah, so so smart contracts at a court level um, typically just aren't viewed as real contracts. So um, like, so this is where uh, plenty of my work has also come in um, is like building the dumb contract to go next to the smart contract. So okay. like yeah. potentially depending on what you want to send someone, like say somebody's doing a lockable and there's music, you could say, Upon purchasing this NFT, a contract will be sent to your email address for you to DocuSign, making clear that you're about to receive private music that only 10 people in the world have access to. You mm -hmm. can't restream it. You can't sell it. You can't do anything with it. You can only resell the NFT. And if you resell the NFT, then we will also transfer the music, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. You, could create, you could create that as like a DocuSign PDF. Yeah, and have that double down proof mm -hmm. but again that's adding a lot of friction yes. to like the goal of nfts which is frictionless um but a lot of creators are trying to make this more interesting and add ip rights and add um i do remember recently there was a musician i can't remember who it was they were relatively prominent <clears throat> um and what they were doing is if you bought their one of one nft they would send you like the final mixed and mastered MP3, MP4, whatever file. Yeah. And they would, they would scrub that file from their computers. Wow. So you would literally, you would <laughs> literally have the only copy of the song, but they also didn't give commercial rights to it. So they didn't want you to be able to take it to Spotify or take okay. it to a DJ. It was basically just like, we made you a private song. If you buy this, you're the only person in the world that owns this song and can listen mm -hmm. to this song. It's your song. And we deleted it. We don't even have the song anymore. Okay. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. But the next level would be, what if you were allowed to take that to Spotify or take that to YouTube or take that to a film production studio and like, you paid 50 grand for the one of one song, yeah. but you go make a few million dollars off of it becoming popular. So and true. then that band would have to like license it back from you to even play it <laughs> at concerts, <laughs> technically, right? Like that's, yeah. that's interesting. It gets more and more interesting the more you like dig in. I think, um, is, that, but, I think that, that, is that moving on to like um, the whole, whole thing we'd obviously board um, Ape Yacht, Yacht Club and whatnot and what they're doing with the licensing? They've kind of introduced that, haven't they? You you buy the yeah. Name. So theirs is like with with the board apes. Like theirs is what I would mention as it's it's not so much the terms as listed on Maker's Place or OpenSea as it is they went ahead and built their own website and they have their own terms. Yeah. But yeah, it it says you know they're giving you the definitions of what you can and can't do, right? So. You can make derivatives yourself. You can approve derivatives from others, but only if you own the ape in your wallet at the time you approve it, right? Which that's a whole nother rabbit trail of like definitions because yeah. like the gentleman who burned one this week, right? He burned his ape and then he okay. made some derivatives and it was crazy on Twitter. You have to go look, this guy burned an ape. So he yeah. sent it to the burn address. That means... He sent it to an address that no one has access to. Yeah. Um, and so if no one has access to it, 
then that means he doesn't have access to it, which means he technically doesn't own that tape anymore, right? It went to a, an unclaimed address. And so if he doesn't own it, he can't approve derivatives technically. Yeah. And so what happened next is it publicly kind of turned into chaos because he did approve people to go ahead and make some derivatives, even though he had already burned it. What? And then the board eight, the board eight team, they like reached out to, to open and had it taken down. Like, Hey, okay. this guy doesn't own that ape anymore. So we don't approve of this use. Like this is, yeah. this violates our copyrights, but that's just like, that's going to get messy. It's going it to get very messy. Wow. So it's, I, I, I'm not even going to ask why that guy done that. Um, <laughs> I, it was, he's, he basically just claimed that it was performance art. He was just being a performance artist. Oh, okay. Like All right. doing something to stir the pot and saying, yeah. you know, look at me, I'm a performance artist. So, you know, I don't, I don't think it, it was nefarious in nature by any means, but it mm. did start some really interesting conversations around ownership and burn yeah. wallets and, None of that has gone to court yet, so we have no idea what the final answer is. Okay, all right. So, uh, so anything that goes on with the, the legal side of uh, NFTs, it gets solved in the real world, of in the real courts, not in a, a crypto court or a decentralized court. It's it happens in the real world. So yeah, so so right now there are two major court cases that everybody like paying attention kind of knows about, like with NFTs. One is against like Dapper Labs, which is NBA Top Shots. Right. And that's just claiming that the Top Shots are securities, um, which is because they think Dapper Labs has too much control. So it makes the Top Shot basically similar to a stock. Is, um, is that to do with the, the people can't draw out their money? They can't, they can't. They that was a different, money. that was a different part of, of the argument, but that is in the court case as well. Okay. Right. Um, and then the, the bigger one that came up, well, maybe not bigger, but more interesting, I guess, that came up yesterday is the Jay-Z, Jay-Z lawsuit. Okay. Um, and basically what happened is Jay-Z's business partner who owns one third of his original album or like one of his old albums. I don't, I, I guess I'll say, I don't know if he owns one third of the whole record studio or if he owns one third of the album or something, but he has some ownership oh, stake. Is that the Dame Dash? Something. Dame Dash? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he owns this chunk of the, of the IP and basically he wants to sell his percentage of the masters as an NFT. Yeah. And technically you are allowed to sell, you know, your ownership of a record, but the way he was trying to do it as an NFT the court actually responded within a day and a court said, right. you know, actually we think Jay-Z's lawyers have a good argument here. And even if you wanted to sell your piece of the record by selling it as an NFT, it makes it look like you're selling the record Yeah, and you're not, you're selling your piece of revenue from the record. And so they did, they went ahead and paused that for now. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think we've seen the last of that case. I think uh, I think he'll try to do something different. And honestly, I think I think NFTs are a viable option for this. I actually I'm I'm a little surprised by the by the court court ruling, but it's another reminder that the courts don't even necessarily know what's going on here. Right? This is all brand new, um, yeah. and it's going to take a while, you know, to get it right. So yeah, but it, it will. This stuff will get settled in real courts. Yeah, it's no me no metaverse court. No metaverse court. <laughs> not, not yet. yet. <laughs> it, it reminds me of, um, there's a project that I've come across. I'm not sure if you come across it yourself. It's called Ban Royalty. Um, mm -hmm. So they, they these guys, the founders have bought catalogs um, okay. that you, you can receive royalty uh, revenue off. And they're mm -hmm. selling it as NFTs so people can get access to pools of uh, catalogs. So that's super sketchy. That's super yeah. sketchy, to be honest, right? Because that's a, that's a security, right? Mm. That's like, that's like buying a share of Tesla stock, hoping to get a dividend from Tesla stock, right? You're you're literally buying a share of someone else's royalty. Like, what if what if you and I could each buy one percent of the Beatles catalog? That would be brilliant, but that would also be a security because we're hoping it makes us more money later, right? That's, like, that's interesting. That is interesting. I mean, because there's another there's another co uh, company called Oculus, and they're offering that okay. also. 
uh, but the artists will sell it themselves. So they could sell, to get funding for themselves as an up-and-coming artist, they can sell, say, 49% of their, their song to their fans. Yeah, they'll be able to yeah. Receive, revenue, they'll be able to see revenue. So. so that one maybe, so that there's, so in art also, I guess I'll take one step back and say, yeah. I'm not a securities attorney and I'm not. Yeah, 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 answer, it's a conversation. <laughs> but but any, any piece that you buy of anything, Hmm. hoping to get a return from owning the thing makes it not a collector, right? It's not like it's a 69 Aston Martin that may or may not go up in value. You're literally buying the thing, hoping to make revenue from the thing, yeah. which is the definition of a security, yeah. right? And that also doesn't mean that that they can't do it and register it as a security. It could be a registered stock and you're basically buying stock in that album. That's, yeah. that's possible as well. Um, but the courts are just so far behind on this stuff. I think this stuff is going to keep popping up for a while yes. before there's any clarity. <laughs> um, one thing that's interesting though, that people could do is um, you could sell like 49% of an album for like debt funding, right? Like it could be a loan. If yes, you wanted to I, think that, I think that was their approach. I think actually, I think that was actual approach, like a loan. Yeah, maybe. That's see, so that's super cool. Like if it was a loan where you were rewarded, so say we each put in five hundred dollars, and yeah. instead of getting X percent of the revenue, what if we got two backstage passes and a copy of the album for mm -hmm. five hundred dollars? Well, that's pretty neat, right? Like I. You know, if, if, if it was a band you liked, especially like an indie band or something, and you're like, yeah, okay, you know, Madison Square Garden, they're going to have one big, big show this year, or they're going to play the Temple Room or whatever they're going to play, right? And you're like, okay, like, that's cool. For $500, I would for sure support my favorite band. Yeah. And so maybe they raise 150 grand from their fans and they don't have to give you a share of their album revenue. But over time, they use their album revenue to either pay your 500 back mm -hmm. or they just treat it like a big Kickstarter. And, you know, you get a couple of rewards and then it's over. Yeah. You know, so there's there's so many different ways to skin to skin that one. Um, and I don't know what the final answer is going to be, but I think music music stuff's really cool. I'm talking to uh, I'm talking on a panel tomorrow at the Grammys, yeah. um, like with the Recording Academy, because a lot of music people are asking the same questions. Like everybody's yes. trying to figure out what they can and can't do and who's going to sue them. And um, <laughs> it's a fun, it's a fun conversation. <laughs> and you're, and you're the guy that's heading, you're heading that conversation or I mean, yeah, yeah, I'll be, I'll be the, the kind of the lawyer, the lawyer representation on that panel. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, that's good stuff. So another thing I want to enter into is ask about DAOs. Now, yeah, I think that's quite interesting. He's, um, it's kind of like, well, to correct me if I'm wrong, it's kind of what we've been talking about, but having control over what happens with governance. Is that right? Mm. So, yeah, so DAOs, DAOs are, you know, technically decentralized autonomous organization. Yeah. And imagine if a hundred people worked at a company and only the CEO can make the decisions. Versus 100 people work at a company and all 100 people have an even vote. Yeah. Um, regardless of whether they're the janitor or the CEO, even yeah. vote. Um, that is coming and it's coming to the metaverse very quickly. And it's ownership of IP, it's building companies, it's building DeFi, it's building a lot of things. And I, I know a couple of people building out DAOs that are more of a social club or more of a company, right? There's there's a lot of different flavors of this word DAO. Um, yeah. But if you buy a governance token in a DAO and you're using it to vote, right? You're voting on things and, and it's just your membership club, basically. Yeah. Sorry. That's right. Then that is, that's very different than if you're buying the governance token, hoping it goes up in value. Yeah, right yeah, again yeah. then it's then it's in a securities conversation so i don't know i'm working <laughs> on a few uh you know it's i think 
I think it's probably unless you've got another like specific question, it's definitely too. It's like a super it's too broad, broad, isn't it? Topic. It's just broad topic. Okay, I just want I just wanted to just touch on it and see your thoughts on what and what's going on. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, what purpose it? What what purpose yeah. are there for DAOs? I mean, you, you definitely a future for it, isn't it? You think there's a lot of opportunities for companies starting in that way? I think DAOs are the DAOs are interesting. The DAOs like I've got I've got some clients and some good friends that are in various of the DAOs. I, I tried to actually, when I mentioned Christie's earlier, one of the reasons that I got engaged with Christie's auction house was a group reached out to me and said, hey, we think we could commit $25 million or so yeah. pretty quickly. And we would like to buy the CryptoPunks, right? The nine CryptoPunks. Okay. They're yeah. like, you know, we're, we're willing to spend 20, 25 million in USD. Yeah. Um, we're in this, they invited me to this private discord. There were only like 60 of us in it. Yeah. Um, and they're like, look, make it happen. And so I had to, I called Christie's or I, I, I called a friend. She used to work there. She connected mm -hmm. me with the head of legal, the head of compliance. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, all right, look guys, I know this is going to be new. This is going to be a new question, yeah. but I've got a group of 70 people that want to pool $25 million and 30 of them are anonymous. How do we do it? How, how do you want to KYC this group? What, what info do we need? How can I help? I'm bringing you a large buyer. Yeah. You know, please work with me here. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, to be fair, like they're on top of it now. And now that I know Noah and Noah like runs the digital art department there, like he's legit. But when I first spoke with them, they were absolutely not even interested in DAOs. It blew their mind. Yeah. They didn't like, they didn't like, they didn't even like the offer, you know, they're like, no, like, so we tried to talk about it for, we talked for like an hour and then we had a follow-up and I tried to email them over like two weeks. And basically they were just like, we're too close to the sale. This is too much work. This is crazy. Yeah. And then I worked with Sotheby's a little bit to help them figure out DAOs. And I tried it with Coinbase to figure out a way to like spin up a, an escrow wallet. And so like, I've, I've had some like, probably some of the bigger, like centralized, decentralized, how do we meet in the middle conversations in general? Like I've, I've had them or been a part of them. Yeah. Um, and the final answer still is just, we're not ready for this. <laughs> yeah. The final answer is we're not ready for this. We don't know how to KYC everyone involved. We don't know how to do this in a way that's like anti-money laundering law compliant. Mm. And like, all of that's fair. Like, we don't know. And I don't fully know. Like, I've got opinions and thoughts yeah. and hopes, but no, no final answers. Um, not yet. And so DAOs have a lot of potential, but anything that's truly decentralized and allows for anonymous players basically just can't interact with the centralized world. Yeah. Not yet, because the centralized world just has too many rules. Yes. Yeah. Do, you know? what, if you, what if you take the approach and not digging into this too deep, but I just want to touch on this. Now you've said that, um, like I said, to my knowledge, the way people, um, that people piece was sold for 69 million, that's mm -hmm. been kind of, fra is it fractionalized? Is it the right term? It's fractionalized now yeah. and, people into it in, and people can invest in, into it. So is that kind of the same thing? How did they get away with that? How did that work? <laughs> I will, I will avoid giving... <laughs> almost any opinion on the B20 situation because it's still a situation. It's still okay. being worked out, being solved. It, mm -hmm. It's done with this approach of purchasing a bunch of people pieces, fractionalizing them, yeah. and then giving access to everyone involved. Um, mm -hmm. But their token also went from like $30 per to like under a dollar per, I think. Yeah, And like everyone's just kind of trying to figure out like, what's happening are we all on the same page like is this going to keep going like you know what what is what's happening so i don't know enough to to give um okay. my my firm opinions on that one all right <laughs> well, well let's get a bit more more surface level not so deep and i want to talk about collaborations because i think that's yeah, a major yeah. thing how do people collaborate because only one person mints and technically yep. they're the owner because they mint it so how, and I've seen a few cases where people have, have kind of said, oh, I created that and someone else has created, someone, someone else has minted it. So they're taking the, the finest of it. 
So how does that work? Yeah. How does that work in, in an NFT? Yeah. Space? Yeah. So the, the mentor is where the original, like where the sales are going to go. Yeah. Um, I've actually got a couple of good like news at this point is like um, foundation, which is one of the curated NFT platforms yeah. foundation um, Charles over at foundation. He's like, really on top of trying to figure out everything he can. He's like the head of creator relations. Um, and after a conversation with me where I was telling him, you know, I'm dealing with so many people, like the split thing just has to be solved. Yeah. Like you need to be able to do like automatic splits internally. And I think it was something already on their radar. And so I can't take any credit for it, right? It was on everyone's radar that splits had to happen. But I think it was under a month it was only like three weeks after our conversation where he went and ran it up the flagpole internally and they got it done so foundation can do automatic splits wow. at this point which is huge is, and is. then and then the there's a company called mint base which is done on near blockchain in eAR okay and mint mint base allows you to split it up to 40 ways Wow. Which would allow for, you know, a little piece to hear or to this charity or to this producer or, you know, mm -hmm. this lawyer, right? You use a lawyer. He says it's going to be two grand to do X, Y, Z paperwork. And you say, hey, do you mind if we just write you in as a line item for like 3% on this thing that we think is going to be successful? It's like, yeah, okay, here's the Ethereum address, right? It's, you know, so up to 40 ways is quite a lot, like quite aggressive. Yeah. Um, but they just said, okay, you know, because they're one of the newer platforms. They're not, they're not super new, but as a newer platform, they were just like, how can we solve every problem out there right away? You know, and make sure that when we come in, we don't have this problem and this problem, and whatever. So I think, I think they did a great job of starting with splits um, automated. But if you think OpenSea and you think about the average like project right now, yeah, splits are a problem. Yes. Um, <laughs> they're not automatic. Um, they require paperwork basically at this, I mean, they basically require a dumb contract that yes. says, you know, upon sale, X percent goes here, X percent goes here. Um, the IP is owned by, you know, if I bring music and you bring a visual, well, then I own my music, you own your visual, like the underlying yes. copyright. Yes, yes. But our, our shared piece that we just created together, we own 50-50. So we both have to approve it if, we, if somebody wants to license it, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot of little nuances in, in collaborations. And I think because of that, a lot of people who did some pretty high-end collaborations in like February and March, like, like some of the bigger artists on Nifty Gateway, yeah. there's a reason that they're all trying to do their own solo drops now. Okay. It's just so much cleaner and so much easier for people to do a solo drop and own their, own their IP, own the project, take all the payment, you know, like it's nobody against anybody else. It's just so much simpler um, mm -hmm. to do it that way. Okay. So pretty much the answer to that is there are two, there's foundation and uh, mint base. Um, and there may be a few others, but those two for are. sure out front. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm wondering well, why is, why wasn't that the first thing, especially with how I, my interpretation, how a smart contract works, it should be simple just to be say, this goes to A and that goes to B once this is sold. But it's yeah, well, we would end up, the, the, the one reason that I'll, I'll keep it slightly yeah. high level there is we could end up in a longer conversation about just like Ethereum protocols and like EIP, like proposed EIPs and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, there are limitations to the way things are being done. Like yeah. if... If I buy an NFT on, on Nifty Gateway specifically, and then I move it over to OpenSea, yeah. or I buy one on Rarible and I move it over to OpenSea, that original creator loses their royalty. Yes. The royalty falls that. off. Yeah. Right? So royalties can fall off. Split royalties aren't really a thing. Mm. Like on the Ethereum like blockchain, it's not part of the way things are written. Um, so it's like somehow having to be done manually on the back end, right? Like, so that's why I'm saying like, I also just don't want to end up in territory where I'm not an expert, but yeah. I do know that it's more of a technology based limitation than it is a personal decision not to, not to add 
you know, to the to the method. Okay, fair enough. As I think that's a good enough answer, and uh, I think everyone will take some kind of value from that. Um, that you answered a lot of things. Another thing I want to touch on, which I don't think anybody talks about, uh, and don't, everyone talks about, is the IP, uh, the storage. Um, understanding. You mean like IPFS? Yeah, where you once you've purchased that NFT, you do, it doesn't actually sit on your computer. It sits on the creator. Right. So if the, if they shut down the computer or they miss it, then it, the NFT will be gone. Is that right? So, so you need so, to the place. So that's again layers. So part of it is there's there's this thing called IPFS, interplanetary file system, right? Mm -hmm. If something goes when something is minted, if it is minted utilizing IPFS, then the data is in this interplanetary cloud, which yeah. means it's it exists forever on the blockchain, as long as the blockchain doesn't go down. Mm -hmm. But if a platform doesn't use IPFS, which several of them don't, and I won't run a list, but if they don't use IPFS and they're using more um, internal servers to host this basically a pointer that says you bought this thing and it just points to a url of the image you bought yeah then technically if the platform failed or went down or their website or servers went down yeah that thing you owned you don't own anymore it's okay. not it doesn't exist um mm -hmm. so yeah the, the metadata and where does the metadata live is a very important question I personally think it's not uh, incredibly relevant or like perfectly relevant until it's like a, maybe it's a hundred thousand dollar piece or fifty thousand dollar piece because if you're spending a thousand dollars on a cool collectible, mm -hmm. it's not worth your time. I don't think to go really freak out over exactly where does it live. Um, I know a lot of purists who won't buy it if it's not on IPFS, yeah. which I, I understand that. But also having talked to some like art conservationists and a fine art insurance broker and a couple of others who are very worried about the integrity of the art, they would never insure something that wasn't on IPFS. But then again, if it's on IPFS, why would they need to insure it? Right? Yeah, but yeah, yeah, true, because it's always going to be there, isn't it? Because it's always there. <laughs> so that's part of you know, something that I hope and, and most people do see, most of my, my clients, obviously, if they're my client, they, they see it, is like, I'm not showing up to NFTs to make money off of these people. Like, I'm not here to scalp anybody. Yeah. But there are certain industries that are trying to figure out how do they not get left behind. And of course, a fine art insurance company would love to figure out how to charge you 50 grand to insure your $10 million NFT. But if you bought a $10 million NFT, there's probably nothing to insure. Yeah, <laughs> makes sense. Right. So <laughs> there's there's some industries really trying to figure out how do they not get left behind, you know? Okay. I guess it's when they start, when people start producing NFTs and also send the physical along with that. So I, I right. spoke to a, a company called Encrypto, Encrypto Art and it's an artist called Lorenzo Quinn. And he's a sculpture, and he's talking. They're, they've called it the technology of putting a microchip into the actual sculpture or right. painting, which reverts back to the certified certificate yeah. which on the blockchain. So, um, yeah. I so that, that is that's like that's exact. That's exactly what um, the Felocious sale is doing today oh, really? at, okay. at Christie. Christie's. So yeah. they have. Well, I don't know if they've got like an NFC chip on the piece or not. But it is five NFTs that also come with five very high-end physicals. Mm -hmm. um, and so the sale is inclusive of these physicals. And because of that, that's where, you know, okay, maybe there's a, maybe there's a combo insurance package. I don't really know, you know, like maybe there's a reason for the insurance to be in play, but probably just not at all for the NFT. It's probably just somehow ensuring the physical that comes along with it but then there's a question of okay let's say somebody pays 10 million dollars for a one-of-one one nft from ferocious that comes with a one-of-one one physical yeah. well how do you put a value on that physical now is it 10 million dollars because the nft was 10 million 
or is the NFT worth 10 million and the physical was just a freebie? That's true. Never, never even thought about it. Or, or is it half and half? <laughs> or is it half and half, right. Yeah. And with this sale, so the Fuosha sale, I'm, I'm like friends with Fuosha a bit. Like I think he's awesome and his artwork's incredible. Yeah. The sale though has a lot of layers. So if you buy a physical piece, each piece comes with like, like for, the pieces are titled 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. It's five years of his life. Yes. But with, with each one comes doodles. So with year 14, it's 14 of his original doodles. Yeah, I see that. 15 is 15 original doodles. So technically, and I think those doodles might come as NFTs as well. So if you buy year 18 for $10 million, you're getting a one of one NFT and a one of one physical. Yeah. And then 18 doodles and 18 one of one NFTs of those doodles. Yeah. So that's like 18, 36, 37, 38. That's 38 pieces for yeah. purchasing lot 18. So how would anyone value? How would you ever value it per piece, especially from an insurance or a data perspective? So yeah. like, I'm, and that's like me just more kind of posing this like high level question of like, this stuff hasn't been solved. And I think it's super cool and it's a really innovative sale. But from an insurance perspective or from a valuation perspective, no idea how to value each piece independently. That makes complete sense. I mean, I guess it's a case of, as an artist, they're just trying to offer as much value and be creative and innovative as possible. But yeah. with that- Because the artist, the, artist doesn't care. <laughs> the artist doesn't care and shouldn't care about how you insure it, right? Yeah. Like, um, they're just trying to say, you know, here's my art, I hope you like it. And that's all they yeah. should focus on. Mm. Um, but all right, dude, I've got to wrap up. I've got to, yes, I've got to no. call. Um, but, but I said, I know it's a time yet, so not a problem. Um, thank you for your time, like so much, so much, so much value. value. And um, enjoyed it, guys. As you heard, Jacob had to run off quickly towards the end of the episode, so we had to end it quite sharply. But I hope you enjoyed it. There's lots of gems. There was so much in there, man. Like, leave your comments below. Let's, let's start a conversation. Talk about what he talked about and what are people's thoughts on the NFT space now? Now you've got that different perspective and what's going to be your approach on creating NFTs now you heard that?